Hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, John Erickson. I've been using okay. I've been using Nick since 2014, um, and have been at Obsidian Systems, where I work today since 2017, doing a whole bunch of fun Nick stuff. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Sway for having no mirror functionality anyone here knows about. So won't be using that, and we'll be glancing over my shoulder a lot. Um, but we'll make it fun. Okay, so today I want to talk about learning the store layer for Nix. Um, this is sort of a new thing for me. Normally I talk about some weird project I've done with Nix itself um, and some various state of completion. But as this is sort of a different NixCon, as we're at this sort of pivot point, thinking about governance, um, regrouping after the worst of the pandemic, we hope. Um, I figured it was good to sort of take a step back and on that theme, talk about something that definitely isn't novel, definitely isn't by me, but is um, sort of the basics of Nix all the way back to 2003, as far as I know. Um, and yeah, so it is new for me, um, but hopefully it goes well. Um, so why the store layer? Um, firstly, I've been writing many RFCs that all seem to sort of circle back onto this, um, along with the projects I like to do with Nix. And also, it's a point of commonality between many different things, a few of which I've listed right there. Uh, and this is a topic I'll come back um, again towards at the end. Um, also, this sort of talk I want to say is not all novel. Um, Gabriela Gonzalez in 2018 did a longer hour length talk. You can see it on YouTube. That's very much of the same theme of trying to peel back the curtain and see what Nix does underneath the hood. So I wanted to give her a shout out. And also Valentin um, on the docs. Uh, much of the material here is actually recycled from things we and also just he's done with the docs. Um, so you can almost think of this as a sneak preview for stuff we hope we'll get into some sort of manual or specification document at the end. Um, OK, so now diving into the material itself. Um, Nick, you can sort of break up the layers. On the left here, I've got Nick itself. And then on the right, I've got some other Nick's ecosystem thing um, at the top. There's the command line, the first thing you see after you download Nix. Then there's Flakes, um, both conceptually and implementation-wise, sort of a design pattern batteries included on top of that. Then the venerable Nix language, um, our sort of JSON, Lambda, lazy thing. And then finally at the bottom, the Nix store. Um, and so that begs the question, what is the Nix store? The others um, we're all sort of directly interact with, but this Nix store thing, we can go months at a time using Nix and not really see or know what it is. Um, so that makes it a little less obvious. Um, but for me, I think the, a good way to think about it is it's firstly a data model, sort of the, the, the core of the abstract interface, and then some operations on that data model. Uh, which mainly follow from the data itself in sort of the classic Fred Brooks, Fred Brooks fashion. Um, and then finally, various implementations of this interface that the first two collectively constitute. Um, and since I said interface, that means the Nick store thought of as an interface is actually not the bottom layer. After all, there's these various implementations beneath it. So uh, let's head in and do the data model. Um, our first task is we want to represent plain old data. Um, since we are a build system, that would be sources and intermediate results as inputs, and also final results, and again, intermediate results as outputs in all our building. Um, at the same time, you can sort of build up NICs from first principles and say, well, no one told me what building is. I just want to know what the data is before we get how to make it. And that's a valid way of thinking about it, too, if not a um, you know, very user story driven one. Um, and the first thing we have to think about with the data model is file system objects. Um, we are, after all, trying to store a bunch of files and run build tasks for those files. Um, and so the way Nix works today is 
a file system object is a one of three things. It's either a plain file, uh, which has the contents and uh, one uh, bool of permissions saying is executable. Um, it has, uh, I, or it could be a directory, which is a map from file names to these file system objects, or it's a symbolic link, um, which is just an arbitrary path. And we have some examples of this, thanks to Valentin. Um, so here's a hello world one. There's a, the root store path um, is, but at this level I haven't said the store path, so you can just think of it as a directory. Um, it has a bin subdir with a hello exe inside. That hello exe would be marked executable. It also has these share man and info dirt, um, and those two hello.infos and hello.1.gz files. Um, so here everything would be either the first two cases, file or directory. Um, here's another example where there is a relative symlink, um, bin directory, and then inside it, a share go bin that would presumably point inside that share directory. Um, and then finally, there's also absolute paths in symlinks. This. So this is all pretty standard Unix stuff, but I think it's good to sort of establish what our what our language is, because if you actually go down like the kernel source code and say, oh, what is a file system? It's sort of a never end ending answer of more complexity. So it's good we we declare a little something in scope and don't worry about the rest. Um, then comes store objects. Um, while we have many directories, there's usually, as we're sort of it, hopefully informally filled with, a top level slash mix slash store slash something. Um, and these top level things are called store objects. Um, sorry, I think I hit the wrong clicker button. A store object has a root file system object, uh, references, which is conceptually a set of other store objects, and a name. Um, now, the set of store object thing is probably not how you're used to thinking about it if you're used to this stuff. Um, we sort of think is the store is a collection of store objects, and store objects don't contain other objects. Um, and basically what that boils down to is we want a very easy way of referring to a store object that is, has all these properties. And kind of the key one there is the easy, oh, it says memorization, but it's supposed to say memoization, that computer word that the word processors never think exists. Sorry about that. Um, and the solution to that is we have these store paths. Um, so the store path is just a reference to store object. Um, but I think over the years we've gotten kind of sloppy about calling the thing it's, that's being referenced also a store path. And that is, that is, that is sort of not quite correct, like, like um, saying a pointer or array is the same thing. Um, the uh, references and the things they refer to are not the same in general. Um, and a store path has this structure, um, the name, which is the same name part of the store object before, the digest, which is, and the name is user controlled, the digest, which is not directly user controlled and computed from all the other information in various ways, and then finally the store dir, uh, which says where it should all be mounted so we don't mix up things that are supposed to be mounted in different places. Um, Okay, so that is that is the sort of core. The store object is the core data of the store layer, um, but we are not just a glorified Dropbox or something. We want to build things, and that brings me to the next part, which is build plans. Um, build plans are graphs, um, nodes are tasks, um, and these are sort of atomic tasks where Nix doesn't have much visibility on what goes inside, but at the same time, it wants it to be sandboxed so that it knows whatever craziness might be happening, those tasks are not interfering with each other. Um, and edges are dependencies between these things or from tasks to the raw inputs which weren't produced by any other task. Um, and this right here, 
Of all the slides today, I think this is the most important one to really get the heart of the store model. Um, other people have plain old data, other systems, other people have graphs, but the sort of combination of our very rigid fine-grained sandboxing and a very fine-grained graph, that's what really makes us lit, uh, Nix. So this is a, it's a, you know, it's a, seems like a simple idea, but it really buys us so much. Um, now, the way we want to represent a task is we call a derivation. And a derivation has this sort of structure. There's the outputs, what we want to produce. The inputs, which is a set of something. Um, and then the sort of more Unix-specific stuff. We have a builder, the command that's going to be run, um, a list of arguments in the classic Unix way, um, a map of environment variables, and another name. Um, the question would be, what is the inputs exactly? And so we want to reference so the plain sources, the plain old inputs, but we also want to reference um, the outputs of derivations. Uh, for before, that's there where the um, Here, back here. So we have, um, actually, maybe I was only at the beginning and I shouldn't go that far. I'll definitely lose myself. Um, so because of this, we want we have these two things. We want to both count them as inputs. How should we do that? Um, and the answer is, at least retroactively, this notion of a drive path, um, which is sort of the way to address everything we can have or potentially have after building in Nix. And a drive path is either an opaque path, which is just a store path, or it's one of these build paths, uh, which is a pair of a store path representing a derivation and an output name. And hopefully soon we will have uh, some surface syntax for that. We already have, thanks to Elko, at a higher level, this caret syntax um, with flake refs and output names. And hopefully we'll be able to reuse that for this too. Um, and so with this, we can then go back to the derivation again, and there we can now see uh, inputs as a set of derived paths um, equivalent to a set of store paths and a set of these build path pairs. Um, and this represents everything we want to represent. Um, realize I've gone really fast, so maybe I'll, uh, if anyone has a question here before I go to the next bit, happy to take one. It's not in the file system, good point. It is, um, and because the drive path is sort of a new concept, it's not immediately obvious if you look at the serialized form of a derivation. But um, it is it's definitely conceptually there, and it's, it's, a, it's a type in the C++ in the implementation. Um, and once we have the surface syntax for it, it should be a little bit of a less mysterious concept. But thanks for asking. Anyone else? OK, I'll continue. Um, the operations. Um, first, there is basic CRUD operation um, on the store objects themselves, except there's no update because store objects are immutable. And then there is building. Um, for the CRUD options, I was worried about time. Um, I think I might actually be OK. but on the slides, so too bad. Still use your imagination. Um, there's a little, but I'll, but we can you can sort of say creating would could be creating a store object from scratch, which could be like using a fetcher or using add to store. Um, reading you could imagine as copying store objects from one or the other using like the next copy command, um, and then finally deleting. We can't delete arbitrary things, but we can garbage collect, and we can try to delete something hoping it's unreferenced. Um, so in sort of a functional flavor, those are our classic um, CRDs um, for store options. 
And then finally, building is sort of the interesting part. And here I do go into detail. Um, so the basic idea you might imagine is before we can build a task, we have to have already built its subtask, um, which means we have to conceptually replace those derived paths with the opaque paths that is the outputs. Um, I, in this simplified slides, I didn't go into input addressing versus content addressing, but Basically, um, in the Nix you probably use today, this is sort of a trivial step where we know what the store objects are called a priori. But in other variations, um, in various states of experimental feature land, this becomes non-trivial, and we don't know what the store object is called until we built it. So this, we actually need to do some substitution here. Um, and then once all our inputs are built, we can build the task we're focusing on. And then we have to collect its outputs which are in this sort of, they exist in the file system, but they're not fully registered. They're not bona fide store objects, and we have to turn them into bona fide store objects. Um, and what that mainly boils down to is uh, verifying and, um, well, collecting and verifying their references, um, which are a subset of the inputs and which must be acyclic. Um, which isn't a problem for already existing inputs, but is a problem for the new outputs, um, which can, which must refer to themselves acyclically. So you can have a out depend on a dev and a dev is dependent on the out at the same time. And so here are some examples. An example I did of all this. Um, instead of hello world, well, I want to give it a dependency. So I made it dependent on a compression library and then I decide, well, what's a, very compressed world, it's a black hole. So, hello, black hole. Um, to start, zlib, as it is in Nix packages, has two outputs, out and dev. Um, it doesn't really matter for this, but to just give you some motivating background, the library itself would go without, and sort of extra development metadata, like C headers, would go in dev. So the first step is to build uh, Zila, which has no dependencies, so we can start right away. And then we, it's just an easy atomic step, um, and we get these two outputs, and my arrows here are supposed to indicate that dev depends on out. Um, my, the arrows are pointing downstream, not upstream. Um, and that could have been either way, but in reality, and in Nix packages, and for the sake of this demo, that out arrow, the, the arrow from when it goes from out to dev and not dev to out and not no arrow at all. Those are all three valid possibilities in principle, but this is the one we're doing today. Then with that happening, uh, we can resolve the hello black hole derivation, um, which is the substitution step or conceptual substitution step. Um, so just as we know that the two outputs of the zlib derivation correspond to those two store objects at the bottom, the bottom two boxes, um, that means the reference from the DRV, the hello DRV to the zlib DRV, we can um, replace that with a, with a store paths to the store objects directly. Um, and that's what's done here. So just cutting out the original derivation, we don't need it anymore is just a uh, opaque path reference of the hello black hole now resolved. But they don't count as a blocking dependency that we have to process first. And then much the same thing happens again. Hello only has a single output named out, and there it is now built. And again, doesn't have to be that way, but matching what actually happens in Nix packages. The hello one is going to depend on zlib out, but not depend on zlib dev. And the dotted arrow again represents that the um, single output of the derivation corresponds with that store object we just produced. And um, then finally we can, just as before, we forgot about the derivation we don't need. We can do that again. And these are our outputs as a result of building these two derivations with the dependencies between them. And uh, that is it, a fully worked out example of building. Any more questions? 
Well, I'm hoping that's a sign I'm actually making some sense. Uh, OK. Um, now, the last thing on my three, uh, three bullet points from earlier, I mentioned there was the data model, the operations, and the implementations. Um, and I also, at the very beginning, sort of alluded to being interested in this because of it was the commonality with um, between many things in our ecosystem. And I'm with this last big diagram slide going to try to get into both those two points. Um, so here is Nix again and some other projects um, taken sort of arbitrarily. Um, we have Nix itself, the, the official implementation in the middle, um, Nix OS and Nix packages off the right. Um, oops, the, sorry, the arrow from Nix OS to Nix patches is mistaken, my bad. But, um, and then uh, you can probably mentally fix that. And then at, towards the bottom, we have some more obscure things. There's the Tavix project you all may or may not have heard of that's trying to re-implement many concepts in Nix. So I have over here their alternate evaluator. Um, and then showing that ideally Nix patches and Nix OS, they will work with any such implementation. Um, and then maybe a bit better known, GUIX on the bottom. So GUIX reuses our Nix store concept um, and GUIX also has packages using, or sorry, it's Geeks. Um, Geeks has packages using Geeks. I'm not quite sure what they call their packages. Um, that there is a uh, Go Nix, which is also associated with the Tvix fuel. Um, and then um, the C Nix store layer on the other side. So the arrows going into the Nix store concept, as described today, would be sort of implementations of that. Um, and then the arrows uh, going in from the other side are uses of that. So I. Um, I try not to pick these things to, you know, bias my point, but I think it's the way it sort of worked out is this Nix store is this pivot point or what we might call from networking a narrow waste where there's many different things above it and many different things below it. Um, and I really, um, oh, okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, as, as basically as we get to be a bigger community and we're you know, having much more involvement and everyone wants to do the different things, I think sort of carving out these layers and finding these sort of commonalities where even though people have many different visions for what the end user story should be, um, this sort of underlying infrastructure remains very unopinionated. I think it's uh, a really good opportunity to kind of talk about this stuff as sort of a consensus building exercise and sort of finding um, th those minimal things that no matter how big and broad and how pluralistic we become, we can all sort of agree on. So I'm really excited um, to sort of popularize the old venerable next door concept as um, sort of a very nice foundational concept that um, no matter what other fancy things we wanna do, um, anchors everything else. And uh, yep, thank you. Um, that's it. <laughs> We do have time for one question. And at the very back, there is one. So let me head over, Tom. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you summarize what you think are the distinctive features of the Nix store concept that sets it apart and what consequences that have to provide benefits that other systems might not have? Uh, sorry, the, the first part of that question, I missed it. Uh, what sets the Nix store concept apart and makes it distinctive from other similar systems? And how does that, what are the consequences of that that give us a unique advantage? Yeah, great question. Um, so for newer systems, I think often having this sort of conceptual layering at all is a bit hard to come by. Um, there is some stuff in, let's say, uh, Basil or other such things, but I feel like you have to dig a little bit harder to find it. Um, so just separating our concepts into layers so you can understand everything at all, uh, 
understand bits in, um, in isolation, I think is somewhat distinctive. Um, older systems like let's say Ninja and CMake also have this layering and uh, let's say a Ninja graph is somewhat um, similar to enrolled to what our like a uh, next store build plans are. But um, on the other hand, those older systems don't have any sort of sandboxing. So I think it's the, the combination of the layering and the sandboxing that makes us unique. Um, and basically the value of that is that um, the layering gives us the flexibility to explore many directions at once without sort of overcomplicating and bogging down the system um, in the way many other projects sort of die of their own growth. And the sandboxing basically allows us to stay sane as we do more things and not um, sort of die under a mudslide of spurious failures and other things like that. So um, yeah, they're really both scaling things. One scaling sort of in the diversity of ideas and the other scaling just in the sheer size and complexity of what we're packaging. Um, so I think, I think that's the, the core value proposition here. Thanks.